In the last segment, we talked about nucleophilic addition to aldehydes and ketones under basic conditions. Now what we're going to do is talk about nucleophilic addition to aldehydes and ketones in acidic conditions. So remember that under basic conditions, what happened was that the nucleophile, typically an anionic nucleophile uh, or an atom that had a very negative polarization and a lone pair of electrons, would directly attack the carbonyl carbon as the very first step of the reaction mechanism. And you can see that in the upper right-hand corner of the slide here as I'm highlighting. That was our mechanism we looked at under basic conditions. Now what we're going to do today is take a look at what happens if the reaction instead is run under acidic conditions. So in acid, one thing that we've learned typically happens is that protonation is the first step of reaction mechanisms, and that is going to hold true here as well. So if we take a look at what happens under acidic conditions, if we have that acid present, the first thing that's going to happen is that we can use that lone pair of electrons from our carbonyl group to come over and attack the proton. And once it's picked up that proton, the purpose of this is that the product of this reaction is going to have a carbon that is now much more electrophilic than the starting carbonyl carbon was. So if we take a look at that carbon that I've highlighted in green there on the product side of this equation. This carbon is now much more electrophilic than it was to start with, and the reason for that is because our oxygen atom that's bonded there is now a cation, and an oxygen cation is certainly very, very electron withdrawing, much more so than just the oxygen that has no formal charge. So we're gonna take a look at some situations today where we can add to the aldehyde or ketone under acidic conditions. So we're going to take a look first at a reaction in which we use an alcohol plus acid to react with an aldehyde or ketone. So let's take a look at this example and we'll try to work our way through a logical mechanism here to get to our final product of this reaction. So we'll go ahead and react as our starting material here. Let's just start with to pentanone and we'll react it with methanol and we'll go ahead and say that the methanol is added in excess here. One purpose of adding the methanol in excess is that this reaction is in actuality an equilibrium process and by adding the methanol in excess we can ensure that we push that equilibrium as far toward the side of the product as possible. So we're going to use methanol and then like I mentioned we're doing this under acidic conditions. So I'll go ahead and throw in some acid catalyst there. You might see that written as sulfuric acid or whatever, just H plus, H3O plus. So in this particular reaction, following up on the general first step of the mechanism that we saw a little bit earlier, since we have acid present, the very first thing that's going to happen, of course, is protonation. So the first step, protonation of that carbonyl oxygen. And that's going to allow us to end up with our very electrophilic, supercharged electrophile carbonyl carbon atom. Now that we will have that carbonyl carbon adjacent to the very electron withdrawing oxygen atom. So there's our intermediate resulting from this step. And now with that very electrophilic carbon atom in place here, what we can do is now show that that's going to be attacked by a nucleophile. So if we look at what's available here in our reaction mixture, we saw that we had methanol available, and methanol with its lone pair of electrons on the oxygen is certainly suitable to act as the nucleophile there. So we're going to go ahead and bring in our methanol molecule, use the lone pair of electrons from the methanol to attack that electrophilic carbonyl carbon, and we can move our pi electrons out into the oxygen there so that we don't go over the octet rule. And that's going to take us through step two of the mechanism, whereby we could describe this as the nucleophile attacks the electrophilic carbonyl carbon. Go ahead and write out our intermediate resulting from this step. So now we have a new bond that's formed between the oxygen of methanol and our carbonyl carbon. So we'll go ahead and just write that in here. 
just going to put a positive formal charge on this oxygen here. And then as you might expect, as we usually do when we end up with an oxygen with a extra proton there that is giving a formal charge on the oxygen, we need to deprotonate that oxygen. So third step of the mechanism here is deprotonation. And as you can gather here by the fact that the first step of the mechanism is protonation and the third step is deprotonation, the acid is acting as a catalyst here. We're going to re be regenerating that at this third step of the mechanism. So you look around and what we have available to act as the deprotonating agent is certainly some more of that excess methanol that's available. So we'll use the lone pair of electrons from the methanol to grab that proton, break the oxygen-hydrogen bond, and bring us to our product of this step. So now at this point, the functional group that's present here should look familiar to you because we have a carbon atom that is bonded both to a hydroxy group and part of an ether group. And as we talked about in an earlier segment, when we have a carbon atom that's bonded to both a hydroxy group and part of an ether group, we refer to this as a hemiacetyl functional group. Now, typically, when we were looking at this reaction taking place under basic conditions, the reaction would stop right here. So for example, if we were working with starting a reaction with a ketone or aldehyde reacting with methanol plus sodium methoxide or some other source of basic nucleophile, we would stop the reaction right here at the hemiacetyl. However, now we're working under acidic conditions and so we can take this reaction a bit further. So we're not done with the mechanism yet. The hemiacetyl in this particular situation of an acid catalyzed reaction is an intermediate rather than the final product. Under basic conditions, the hemiacetyl was the final product. But here, under acidic conditions, what we recognize is that we have a hydroxy group in our hemiacetyl molecule. And that hydroxy group, we've seen in many situations in the past, is able to be protonated if there's acid present, and certainly there is. So step four of the mechanism, what we're going to do is another protonation step where we're going to protonate that hydroxy group because alcohols are certainly very prone to picking up protons. So the alcohol group there is acting as the base. It's going to use its lone pair of electrons here to come over and form a new covalent bond to the proton there of our acid. And we'll go ahead and draw out our intermediate resulting from this step. So now we have OH2, which you hopefully recognize as a very good leaving group. So we've got our OH2 there with a positive formal charge on the oxygen. And then we also have our methoxy group, OCH3, that's still bonded there. Now with this, this in mind, Now that we have our positive formal charge on our oxygen, we've set up our H2O as our leaving group here in this reaction. What we're going to do then is indeed have that leaving group break away. So we can show the leaving group breaking away by taking those electrons from the covalent bond, moving those so they're on the oxygen. And that's going to give us, as a result of this step, a carbocation intermediate. And we've still got our methoxy group bonded there. Go ahead and fill in my water intermediate there. So at this step, one of the main factors that is able to promote this step happening is the fact that the carbocation intermediate that we have formed here is going to be stabilized by resonance, which can certainly occur anytime you have a lone pair of electrons on an atom adjacent to the carbocation. So we could just take that lone pair of electrons from the oxygen, move that down to make a second resonance structure. This is going to be a particularly favorable resonance structure because it has maximized the number of covalent bonds in the molecule, and all of the atoms have an octet, which both of which are very important factors in determining the stability of resonance structures. So we made a very favorable resonance structure here on the left-hand side, highlighted in yellow. 
And that's going to help promote this particular step of the reaction mechanism in occurring. And that step we could describe as the leaving group leaves. And water there is our particular leaving group. So our water leaving group breaks away. And then from there, we now have certainly an electrophilic carbon atom shown here with our blue delta positive in our structure on the left or on the resonance structure on the right. That carbon actually has a full positive formal charge. And so that carbon atom is going to be very prone to attack by a nucleophile. And we mentioned at the very onset of this reaction way up here that we had an excess of our methanol molecule. So what's going to happen is that that methanol that's available is going to come in and it's going to attack at the carbonyl carbon. And we can show that attack happening on either of these two resonance structures. You can use the one on the left or the one on the right. It doesn't matter which one you choose. I'm going to go for the one on the left here because it's the one that we haven't already cluttered up with electron pushing arrows. So we have our nucleophilic oxygen come in, attack the carbonyl carbon as the pi electrons go up onto the oxygen. And that's going to take us to our next intermediate. So this would be step six of the mechanism. And I know this mechanism is pretty heavy in steps, but the thing to keep in mind is that you have seen all these types of steps in some way, shape, or form or another. So it's really just a matter of hopefully logically working your way through these different steps of nucleophile attacking electrophile, acid-base reactions, and things that you've seen many times. So this step six we would definitely just describe as the nucleophile, and that's our methanol attacks the electrophilic carbonyl carbon. So we'll go ahead and write out the intermediate that would result from this step. And this is going to put us just one step from home plate here. And hopefully once we get this drawn in here, you can make a very logical guess here or hypothesis about what the last step of the mechanism is. So at this point, we have that extra proton hanging out on the oxygen. And so certainly the last step of the mechanism is going to be deprotonation. So with that deprotonation step, we can take methanol that's available, use the lone pair electrons from methanol to come in and grab that proton, like so break the oxygen-hydrogen bond, and that's going to lead us to our final organic product here. Where now we have a single carbon that is bonded to two different ether groups, like so. We would also, as a result of this, be creating CH3OH2 as a result of that protonation of our alcohol there. So the main thing we're gonna focus on here is our geminal diether molecule, which I've outlined in yellow here. So our geminal diether is more commonly known as an acetyl group. So geminal diether is the same as an acetyl group. Acetyl groups are really important synthetically because ethers, as we learned several chapters ago, are relatively non-reactive functional groups. So acetyls are commonly used as what are referred to as protecting groups, where the acetyl group will be installed in place of a reactive carbonyl group. And then at the very end of a whole reaction series, what would be done is that this reversible reaction would be run in the opposite direction. We mentioned that this reaction is reversible. All these steps can be reversed. So I can show all these arrows going both in the forward direction and the reverse direction. So at the very end of a reaction, the molecule will be deprotected to return it back to the carbonyl if that were the desired final product. So at several steps of the reaction, the scientists might desire to keep the molecule as the acetyl to so-called protect that group from undesirable reactions that would otherwise take place at the carbonyl. And at the very end, this acetyl group can be removed by reversing this reaction that we just talked about. So acetyl groups are going to be very 
commonly used in synthesis as protecting groups. And let's take a look at another acetyl formation reaction just to go through the mechanism one more time here and to look at an example of some intramolecular reactions going on. What we're going to do in this example is we're going to start off our example problem here by looking at one butanal. And we're going to react that one butanal with one two ethane diol. So we're going to react with a two carbon diol here. And we can just go ahead and fill in our structure of butanol here as well. And we're going to run this under acidic conditions, keeping with our theme of today. We're going to try to predict what the final major organic product would be resulting from this reaction. And we can assume here that the 1-butanol and the diol are present in a 1 to 1 molar ratio. So the first step of this mechanism, much like what we saw in the previous mechanism we looked at, is going to be protonation. So we're going to go ahead and protonate the carbonyl group from our butanol. And you may be asking yourself, why do we protonate the carbonyl group of butanol rather than protonating one of the hydroxy groups on our diol? The reason for this is if we protonated the diol group the reaction would not be productive. There'd be nowhere for it to go from there. So certainly in the real world context, if we were looking at what's going on in a reaction flask, there is some protonation of the alcohol going on at any given moment, but that protonation is not productive. It doesn't lead us toward a final product. So the productive protonation here is going to be the protonation of the one butanol. So that's what we're going to protonate in showing this mechanism to demonstrate how we're getting to a final observable product here. Go ahead and show our protonated intermediate. And now that we have done that, we're staged for the nucleophile to come in and attack. And our nucleophile, in this case, is going to be one of those hydroxy groups from our dial. So we can take whichever one of those we want, bring that over, and use the lone pair of electrons from that to attack our carbonyl carbon, which is now very electrophilic due to the fact that it is adjacent to that positively formal charged oxygen atom. So that takes us through step two of the mechanism, which was our nucleophilic attack step. And now we can go ahead and write out what would be the intermediate resulting from this. So we're going to have an OH group present there. And then I'll go ahead and show my bond to the diol oxygen in green there. It's going to be bonded to a proton. And then we have a two carbon chain associated with that, followed by our second hydroxy group. So this is going to be our intermediate. We need to fill in our formal charges here. So we have a formal charge of plus one on our oxygen there of our intermediate. So that brings us to our next step. And the next step of this mechanism, step three, is going to be a deprotonation step because we need to lose that proton that I'm showing here in red. So we're going to deprotonate. And we can show the deprotonation happening via attack of another alcohol molecule because alcohols will easily gain and lose protons. So I'm just going to show that alcohol at attack happening here by abbreviating a structure of an alcohol as ROH. We'll have that oxygen come in, act as a base to grab that proton, break the oxygen-hydrogen bond, and that's going to take us to our next intermediate here. And I'll continue showing that what originated is the diol here in green. So now we have our oxygen with two sets of lone pair electrons. 
to carbon chain and hydroxy group that I'm showing up top here. Now, at this point, we could recognize that we are at the hemiacetal portion of the reaction, because if we take a look at what we have here, we see that we have a carbon that is bonded to both a hydroxy group and that is part of an ether group. So we could describe this certainly as our hemiacetal intermediate. Hemi means that we're basically halfway to the acetyl final product here. So now we go into phase two of the reaction mechanism, which is where we're going to go through another protonation step, where we're going to be protonating the hydroxy group right here. And it has to be this hydroxy group that's getting protonated to make the reaction productive. We could certainly also protonate other locations in this molecule, such as the other hydroxy group, but that's not going to lead us to a final product. So we go ahead here and do our protonation. So we'll protonate our oxygen atom right there like so. And we'll go ahead and write out what intermediate would result from that protonation step. So now we've got our OH2 with a positive formal charge on the oxygen that, as we've seen before, is really well staged to act as a leaving group. And then we'll go ahead and draw in the rest of our molecule here. And at this point then, what happens is the water breaks away as a leaving group to give us that resonant stabilized intermediate. So step five, leaving group leaves, and that leaving group in particular is water. So we can show that breaking away and leading us to our resonance stabilized intermediate where that resonance would be the same type of resonance that we were seeing for our last example. So we could certainly show a resonance structure here where we showed the lone pair of electrons from the oxygen coming down like I'm showing here. I'm going to omit showing that this time in the interest of getting us through the reaction mechanism and assuming that you can draw that second resonance structure based on the info from earlier. So what we're going to do instead here is we're going to go onward to the next step of the mechanism, which is that after the water leaving group has left to give us that resonance stabilized carbocation intermediate, now we're going to be set up for the nucleophile to attack the electrophilic carbon atom. The electrophilic carbon atom is the one that is shown as our carbocation. So the nucleophile attacks the electrophilic carbon. And that electrophilic carbon is going to be attacked intramolecularly this time via our hydroxy group that's present here, and will just so conveniently enable us to make a ring of five or six atoms. We've talked previously about five or six atom rings being particularly stable. And so this is going to be a pretty favorable intramolecular reaction. So we have our hydroxy group coming down as we're showing with the green electron pushing arrow to form a covalent bond to our carbocation. So that's going to close up our ring in this intramolecular reaction this time. We'll go ahead and draw out what's going to result from this. And this is the point where if you're having trouble keeping track of how big the ring should be, this is a good opportunity to number the atoms of the ring so that you can sort out exactly who goes where and what um, position they're going to have. So I'm just numbering this to show all of the atoms, the five atoms there in yellow that will be part of the ring. Keep in mind, the way I'm numbering this has nothing to do with IUPAC nomenclature numbering or anything like that. I'm just numbering those atoms so that I can get them in the right places for making the proper ring and getting the right connections going on. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a five-membered ring. I'm going to put one of those atoms of the ring as an oxygen atom. And then I'm going to go in and number those atoms according to how I have numbered the chain up top prior to the cyclization. So we were calling that oxygen atom number two of our ring, carbon number one, 
So we just go through here. And if we've done this right, we should see that we saw carbon number five and carbon number one were forming a link to one another. And that's exactly the case that was happening up here based on our green electron pushing arrow that we were showing. So this seems okay so far. What we need to do now is go in and now fill in what other groups are going to be present there and where those are going to be located. We also need to keep in mind that number five is an oxygen atom as well rather than a carbon. So we're going to fill that in. So at carbon number one, that's where we have that three carbon chain coming off. And if you take a look at your three carbon chain, you will see that that three carbon chain is in no way, shape, or form incorporated into the ring. It's going to be hanging off as a side chain. So we need to draw that three carbon chain in. So we'll go ahead and do that. One, two, three. And there's a hydrogen there bonded at carbon number one as well from the aldehyde. And we don't necessarily have to show that because of the fact that it's implied in this line angle formula. And if we come over to carbon number five, carbon number five, I'd showed it as having a lone pair there, which is actually getting a little bit ahead of myself because that at the moment is going to be a proton there prior to deprotonating. And we would have a positive formal charge there. So at this point, we've got all of our atoms in place from our intermediate there leading into step six. And now heading to home base, we just need to do a deprotonation to get us to the last step through the last step of this. So we'll go ahead and deprotonate our intermediate here. And we can accomplish that again by using some alcohol that is available in the reaction mixture. So we take our lone pair electrons, bring them over to grab that proton. That's going to force the oxygen-hydrogen bond to break. And that's going to lead us to our final product, which if we've done this right, we're expecting to see an acetyl group in our final product here. And indeed we do, we can look at that. I'll highlight that in yellow. We have a single carbon here that's directly bonded to ether groups. And so therefore that would certainly qualify as an acetyl group. So the things to keep in mind about this reaction are really that when we look at the reaction, we can think of it really occurring in two stages. The first stage, is the formation of the hemiacetal, which we get by doing protonation, nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl, and deprotonation to lead us to the hemiacetal. And then assuming that we have an excess of alcohol, that is at least two equivalents, we can then continue onward with the process and do a protonation step of that hemiacetal. The water leaving group leaves, Nucleophile attacks the electrophilic carbon, and then finally deprotonation. And these last four steps here that we've highlighted in green are what are made possible by the fact that there is acid present in the reaction mixture. If there is no acid present, then you can't get that protonation step number four. And so the product would be trapped at the hemiacetal stage. And that was what was happening when we were running these reactions in basic conditions. But now under acidic conditions, we can go through and do all this extra fun of steps four, five, six, and seven to get us to the final acetyl product.